um, to today's uh, ASIL lecture in which uh, Dina Zuvala will present her uh, new book, uh, Capitalism as Civilization, A History of International Law. It's a, a wonderful, really, really wonderful um, masterpiece with uh, yeah, strong argument, a lot of challenges um, on how to think about the uh, history of international law. Um, uh, I will not try to make more sense of the argument uh, as of now, but uh, would leave that uh, to you just to introduce you very briefly, Tina. Um, so Tina Savala is a senior lecturer since uh, July last year at the Australian National University College of Law. Before that, she worked as a uh, laureate, um, as a, sorry, as a postdoc in the laureate program at Melbourne University. And her book is a much further uh, elaboration uh, of uh, thoughts and work that started uh, at the University of Durham, where she pursued her um, PhD. Um, she's also a member of the editorial collective of the Third World Approaches to International Law Law Review. It was launched recently, and a, she's a special advisor, senior advisor to the UN Rapporteur on the right to food. Um, so it's without further ado, Tina, that I uh, would want to thank you just once more so much for accepting our invitation to um, present and discuss your, your work with us. So it's already made uh, quite a few few ripples and, uh, you know, um, yeah, it, it will be it will be an important point of reference for for some time uh, to come. And uh, we therefore very much appreciate your, your willingness to present and engage with us on this work. And I would um, now want to give the virtual floor to you to yeah, uh, map it for us, and then we'll open the debate. So the idea is that Tina will speak for about half an hour. Um, that will be recorded. And um, then we stop the recording and engage in the Q&A and try to push Tina into saying something that you might not want to say uh, on record. <laughs> Let's see but how, if we succeed. The floor is yours. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's getting late here, so I will almost certainly say something I shouldn't say. Um, yeah, uh, to begin with, I really want to thank Ingo for these extremely kind uh, invitations and for his even kind and words. And I want to thank you everyone for turning up. And I just also saw that uh, my supervisor in Durham, Glider Hernandez, just turned up and I want to thank him uh, for his extreme levels of patience uh, during the PhD. Uh, so before I, went, I, go, I get started, I want to also acknowledge that I'm um, zooming in from Canberra and that Canberra is the country of the Naragal and Gambri people. And I want to acknowledge that sovereignty uh, over these lands has never been lawfully ceded. And I want to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And, you know, I'm doing so also having some sense of the relevance this has to my own work that centers questions of imperialism and colonialism in international law. And I'm doing so basically on stolen land. Um, so what I'm going to do for the next 30 minutes or so is to give you a sense of the overarching theoretical framework and theoretical um, intervention of the book. Um, and then I'm really happy to take obviously questions about this bit, but I'm also really happy to discuss if any of you for some reason have read the book to discuss particularities about different historical chapters. So just to make sure we're all on the same side, the book is obviously about the standard of civilization. And generally speaking, just to make sure we're on the same page, in international law, the standard of civilization has been understood as a standard that created a tripartite hierarchy amongst political communities. On the top, we found the so-called semi-civilized states, notably white majority Christian Western states. So including Western European states, North American states and the white Commonwealth, including of course, Australia. Somewhere in the middle of the hierarchy, you found so-called semi-civilized or barbarous states. This included predominantly Asian empires such as Japan, 
China, Siam, Persia, and the Ottoman Empire, which enjoyed a degree of international legal personality. Um, and especially, they had just enough international legal personality to basically sign it away. So they could sign treaties, which are now known as unequal treaties, um, that imposed a particular and formally non-reciprocal legal relationships between them and imperial powers. And at the bottom of this hierarchy, you found so-called uncivilized states. This predominantly included African political communities, but again, very relatedly to me, um, indigenous peoples around the world who were considered not to enjoy any political status under international law but they were only protected by basic considerations of humanity so at least in theory you couldn't kill them in large number without being asked any questions but that was the degree Yeah, okay, accidentally, yes, okay. Um, so they didn't, you couldn't kill them without uh, being asked any questions, perhaps, at least in theory, but um, they did not, um, they did not enjoy any other rights. And for example, even examples of treaty making between um, African chiefs and um, Western states were of questionable legality under international law. So that's, that's the gist of it, right? So the standard narrative, if you open an international law textbook, you know, the ones that happen to have two pages of history in the beginning and then they move on, the standard narrative you get is that basically this has been an important standard in the 19th and early 20th century, but basically it became parochial after 1945 and the promulgation of the UN Charter, right? And the narrative is, this was clearly, I mean, you don't need me to tell you that, there was clearly a racist standard. After 1945, all international lawyers, the standard narrative goes, recognized the errors of our way, we stopped being racist, the um, UN Charter um, introduced formal legal equality, and the standard of civilization is not relevant anymore. There is a small hiccup to that, and the hiccup is literally in Article 38 of the ICJ statute. It's not even very well hidden, right? If you go there, you will see that one of the three main sources um, of international law for ICJ purposes, but more generally these days, is the general principles of law as recognized by uh, the domestic law of civilized states. And I'm really interested in the fact that the, the, the most common instruction people like students of international law get in relationship to Article 38.1c is to read it out, is to misread it. The, the argument you usually get is, well, these days, civilized states doesn't mean anything. Civilized states is every state. So I'm really interested with the about the fact that, you know, we, the formal, the official or the standard legal narrative there is to actually misread Article 38, to read it as if the word civilized is not there. As you can imagine, this is all but um, a unanimously accepted um, idea. And one of the principal challengers of this idea, of course, has been Tony Angi, who in his path-breaking imperialism, sovereignty, and the making of international law, argued that civilization far from being a uh, parochial or redundant, is actually yet another expression of what Angie calls the dynamics of difference. The dynamics of difference, namely the tendency of international law to create non-Western others and subsequently to devise a number of administrative and legal techniques in order to breach this imaginary gap between self and other. That's the Tony Angi argument, and that's pretty much a very common way of third world approaches to international law argument about civilization, right? Here is a slight problem with this argument. If you go to Google Books and you literally, or if you open a bunch of international law textbooks or even specialized treatises, it is a matter of fact 
that explicit usages of the word civilization and its derivatives have indeed declined, maybe not since 1945, but certainly since the 1960s and the 1970s. So it is actually true that international lawyers, at least explicitly, don't seem to be using the concept that much anymore. And this, this I think this raises a certain problem if you want to say, as I do actually, that civilization remains relevant. My answer to that is the following. There is value to treating civilization not as a unitary concept that ever availed itself to some sort of coherent definition. Rather, there is value in treating it as a style or a form of arguing about the distribution of rights and duties in international law. And this style of form of arguing occasionally or at some point in history was also encapsulated in the word civilization. But that's not necessary. There is no necessary connection between this word civilization and its derivatives and the existence of the style of argument. And if this is true, then the decline of explicit usage of the word is interesting in its own right, right? It's worth inquiring why it happened. And I have a theory um, on why it happened, but it doesn't mean that this style of form of arguing also went out of vogue. And I mean, if you are not really persuaded on why um, we should treat civilization as a standard and as a form of argument to begin with, my very superficial answer is generally speaking, lawyers are not in the process of defining concepts for the purposes of, I don't know, truth beauty, transcendental morality or whatever. Generally lawyers, and that sounds quite trite, but I think it's true, generally lawyers are in the process of making legal arguments, as uh, circular as it sounds. And even when lawyers sound like they're defining terms, in reality, they're defining those terms in order to assign particular legal consequences to them. So to me, it sounds like treating things like concepts subject to definition seems to me actually slightly to sit slightly orthogonally with what the lawyer work is all about. Let's say that you buy this, right? If this is a style of argument, what style of argument is it? I'm proposing to you that this is a style of argument that is both bifurcated and in internally unstable. And it is bifurcated and internally unstable because it entails a constant oscillation between two poles. On the one hand, what I call the logic of improvement, and on the other hand, what I call the logic of biology. The logic of improvement on the one hand is a logic that promises to non-Western political communities equal inclusion conditional upon embracing the institutions of basically capitalist, moder capitalist modernity. So things like, especially private law, right? At the end of the day, when all is said and done, to be civilized means to have private um, property and contract. It also entails things like legalization of social affairs and of international affairs. So in a sense, in order to be included in international law, you need to be civilized, but one of the markers of civilization is using international law in your international affairs. You need things like state centralization, you need bureaucratization of the state, and so on and so forth. And in the 19th and early 20th century, just to give you a sense, the poster child of this logic of biology was Japan, right? Japan, Japan excuse me, in the last quarter of the, 20th, of the 19th century, underwent a rapid top-down process of modernization and transition to capitalism. And in 1899, extraterritoriality in Japan was abolished and the understanding was that after that Japan had joined the so-called family of nations on an equal footing. And, and the argument um, in Japan then became also you know, a stick and a carrot for other non-Western political communities that if they do as well as Japan did, they will indeed be included in international law. 
However, at the same time as this logic of improvement operates, another logic operates too. And this is the logic of biology that constantly defers this promise of inclusion based on ideas of immutable difference. And these ideas of immutable difference have historically taken a variety of forms. I, I draw out three, sex, race, and childhood. When arguing through the register of sex, international lawyers were thinking of sex obviously as stable, binary, and, and biological. And they were gendering certain states as feminine and therefore basically as emotional and hysterical, or they were gendering them as hyper-masculine and therefore again irrational and overly violent, and therefore we're saying, well, it's not a very good idea to give to the hysterics equal rights and duties. The other very obvious idiom of immutable difference, of course, was the idiom of race. And the third idiom was the one of childhood, right? That Political non-Western political communities are bodily and intellectually immature at this moment of time, and only through the guidance and often tough love of their elder brothers or uncles, they will get to achieve a full maturity and therefore full inclusion. So this is the bifurcation, logic of biology, logic of improvement. How about the internal, the discursive instability? So this is perhaps obviously the most deridian or deconstructive part uh, of my argument that says, well, you know, West, the West political thought loves the binary, but the problem is the more you start looking at this binary, the more it, it starts collapsing into each other. So basically what appears to be the institution of capitalist modernity, if we try to derogate it a bit, tends out to be the culturally, historically contingent ways in which people who came to understand themselves as white or Western exhibited political power. And one very common example of that is Max Huber's award in the island of Palmas. Max Huber starts by saying, to have sovereignty, you have to be a responsible sovereign who basically guarantees life and property, right? So that sounds pretty much like a capitalist modernity, capitalist and modern state. In reality, what decided whether it was the Netherlands or Spain that had um, sovereignty over the island of Palmas was nothing of the sort. What actually grounded Huber's decision were things like, was it the Netherlands or Spain who had the least inaccurate, because they were both inaccurate, who had the least inaccurate map of the region? Was it the Netherlands or um, Spain that had planted flags and coats of arms on the islands. Neither maps nor flags and coats of arms are necessarily some really deep prerequisites of capitalist modernity, but they are the historically contingent ways in which Western Europeans came to signal political power, right? So you start from this very great pronouncements of responsible statehood of property and individual liberty and life, and you end up with, with inaccurate maps. And it also works on claiming the other way around. What looks like the logic of biology and especially race, if you dig a little bit, turns out to be really deeply connected to capitalist modernity. And my example here is, of course, um, racialized slavery in the United States. So even before the US Civil War, and while racialized slavery persisted, no international lawyers who I know of ever questioned whether the US was a civilized state, right? Whereas otherwise slavery was considered a marker of lack of civilization, but not when it came to the Southern states of the US. In a very obvious way of explaining this is the logic of biology, right? Of saying when it came to white people enslaving black people, slavery was surprisingly tolerated in international law. Whereas when it, we discussed other forms of slavery, international lawyers became much more jumpy. However, 
you know, at the same time, it is impossible to talk about these forms uh, of slavery, even in the writings of international lawyers, and not say the fact, for example, that the argument was not just racist, even though, of course, it was, but it was things like slavery is good for some people, basically because it, it introduces them to, uh, to the circuits of capitalist modernity, it teaches them the value um, of working every day, right? Or it, teaches, or it teaches them the value of productive work, namely work subjected to the imperatives of capitalist accumulation instead of, let's say, subsidence. So that's the one way in which they collapse into each other. The other way they collapse into each other is in a sense in the question who decides or in the question of jurisdiction, right? In the sense that even when arguing within the logic of improvement, which is seemingly at least egalitarian, everyone can attain it. International lawyers, Western international lawyers, have been claiming for themselves the authority to unilaterally impose and assess the criteria of civilization and improvement, which only makes sense from a position of um, superiority, right? Only like that you can be the legislator and the judge of the international community. And as I explained in chapter two, um, that I think actually I shared with you in case you had time to read, it was on the ground of who decides that a lot of legal battles between Western and non-Western peripheral and non-Western or peripheral international lawyers were um, waged. So non-Western non-Western international lawyers did not necessarily challenge um, um, the logic of improvement, nor even exactly the logic of biology, but they did assert from themselves the authority to proclaim when their political communities had indeed become civilized. Why should you care about any of these if, you, well, full stop, but why should you care about any of these if you are not a historian of international law? And I think you should care about these more broadly if, if you're into international legal theory or even legal theory or even thinking about law for a number of reasons. And the way to explain this, the, the way I do it usually is by explaining how I reworked my own PhD and I got into this argument, which is very different to the argument of my PhD thesis. Basically, the, the story goes, I finish my PhD in Durham, I wrap up, I, I pack my stuff, I come to Melbourne, where I reread from Apology to Utopia, and my main problem was I didn't have a good argument against it. And that raised a problem to me as um, somebody who understands herself within the Marxist um, camp, which is how can I do this? How can I think that from a post to utopia is basically correct and remain a Marxist? And this is not just, I think, my consent, right? And the answer, the usual answer is you can't. So people like Chimney or people like Rose Parfit have basically um, accused, not just from apology to utopia, but all critical legal arguments that hinged on structure and determinacy, they have accused them of basically immobilizing critique. The argument goes something like that. If international law is indeterminate, how can you say it does anything in the world? And I think that's a problem for Marxist and left legal theorists, but I think it's also for others, right? If, if you care about what law does in the world, that's a problem indeterminacy poses for you, if you buy the argument that law is indeterminate in a structured way. My own argument where I landed goes something like that. There is no prima facie problem between Marxist or left legal theory and structured indeterminacy. The real problem is the following. The real problem is um, the gentle civilizer, and the real problem is the politics of international law. And my argument like, goes something like this. After the gentle civilizer, ca the charismatic authority of the international lawyer was posed 
as a limited but real answer to the problems of legal indeterminacy. And I don't have much time um, for this argument for a number of reasons, which I'm happy to explain later. And secondly, in the politics of international law, Marti Koskinemi seems to articulate a theory of international law's bias that does not hinge on international legal indeterminacy. Basically, in the politics of international law, Marti Koskinemi says, is the the bias of international law hinges on its institutions. So he has, you know, this um, turn of phrase that says, once you know which institution will dispose of a question, you can make a pretty good educated guess on how the question is going to be disposed of. The IMF and the Human Rights Committee are likely to be dealing with the same question in a really, really different way, right? So bias is in the institutions. And my um, answer is, what, is uh, what if actually bias is in the indeterminacy? What if we can understand something about what international law does in the world by way of examining the particular way in which it is indeterminate? By the way, this only works if you believe in structured indeterminacy, if you think indeterminacy is totally unstructured, the argument doesn't work, this is not for you. Um, so my argument goes something like this. What if this particular structured indeterminacy I have just described is the way in which international law manifests its pro-capitalist bias, but at the same time is unable to resolve it? And my argument goes some, somewhat like this. Capitalism, which I understand as generalized production for exchange and, prof and profit, tends to do two things at the same time. And the important bit here is the at the same time. It tends to expand in a way that overcomes or limits borders. Um, so, you know, in the Grundrisse, Marx says that every limit is a limit to become, to be overcome. And in so doing, in overcoming these limits, it homogenizes space, law, culture, life, worlds, name it however you want. But at the same time, this expansion happens fundamentally in uneven ways, thereby creating fragmentation, divergence, stratification, both between political communities, but also with within populations. So basically my argument is that the logic of improvement and the logic of biology reflect these two real um, and simultaneous tendencies of capitalism, but they cannot resolve it. So hence the indeterminacy bit, right? Hence the constant oscillation, which is international law cannot provide an authoritative response um, or an authoritative resolution um, to the contradictions uh, of global capitalism. So in a sense, my argument is an argument both about law's complicity and potency, but it is also to a very large extent an argument about laws, incompetence and impotence, right? It, it does something, but at the same time, it cannot resolve things in a fine, finite way. So this is roughly um, the argument. Uh, and for those of you who might not have had the chance to have a look, I developed this in an introduction, conclusion, and four substantive chapters. I shared with you the first substantive chapter, which is chapter two, that deals with 19th century articulations of civilization and especially looks at unequal treaties. And I'm trying to have a certain rereading of the rise of semi-peripheral international lawyers as only partial detractors of civilization. As I said before, semi-peripheral international lawyers contested the who decides logic, but the who decides question right. Um, but they did not necessarily contest exactly neither um, improvement nor um, uh, biology, and I can expand more on this later. Then I revisit the League of Nations and the mandate system, and I'm especially interested in the emancipation of Iraq, which was the only state that became independence while the League was still um, 
operating. And one of the reasons I do so is to show that already in the 1930s, the language of civilization had started being in decline, but the same criteria as, for example, in the 19th century were being articulated in order as preconditions for Iraq's independence. So to also start, you know, relativizing this idea that if the word civilization is not there, then civilization is not relevant. Then I'm looking at the Southwest Africa saga um, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, where, um, as you may know, actually civilization, the sacred trance of civilization was the whole base of the litigation in front of the ICJ. And what I'm trying to track there is the way in which radical post-colonial lawyers, radical and post-colonial lawyers try to use civilization against the grain, but in a sense, they got caught in this conundrum that I have already um, described. And finally today, um, looking um, at two separate instances of the war on terror. I'm looking um, at the occupation and um, neoliberal reform of Iraq um, after 2003. And I'm also looking at um, the so-called unwilling or unable doctrine in the use of Bellum. And I'm trying to make the argument that, of course, in modified terms, but nevertheless, um, this basic argumentative structure that I have described emerges time and again um, in these debates. I think on that note,